Welcome to a special election edition of the Report Card. I'm Nat Malkus, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Today, one day after millions cast their votes in the 2018 midterm elections, I'll have a discussion with three guests about what those results mean for education at the national level and down the ballot. I have three great guests today. Two of my colleagues from AEI, Rick Hess, our Director of Education Policy, and Jason DeLisle, who studies higher education policy, will join Lene Erickson, Vice President for Social Policy and Politics at Third Way. So without further ado, let's jump into my conversation with Lene, Jason, and Rick. Welcome, guys. So we had a big election last night. We just had a panel to talk about it. I want to start off with the same question, and then we'll just talk for a while. I want to know how the education politics change because of this election. But first, how much did education politics play a role in this election moving moving into Election Day? It didn't very much. This is one thing where Rick and I definitely really agree. I mean, I think when you ask people the list of things that they care about, education is somewhere in the double digits every single year. And this year in particular, with so many other things, um, both on the left and the right, that people were listing as priorities. Year, yeah, but this year was supposed to be different, right? We had be. the teacher strikes. Right. I had – there were 2,500 teachers cover. running in New Mexico for office. Right. There, were, there were 9 million former educators That's running right. on the eastern That's seaboard. Right. And, and one – Teacher of the Year. Right. Uh, we made it in. And, you know, it, 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 you know, and it's funny because in the education media, because they got to come up with an interesting narrative, they actually do some version of this each year, how much education is going to matter. Right. And the reality, it rarely does. Last time it actually mattered much was in 2000 uh, during Bush Gore. Um, since 2004, education's usually in the Gallup, 2 to 5% of respondents right. say education's their big issue. It usually ranks 9th to 14th among issues, like when they said. This time, it was at 2% and ranked 12th. It just wasn't a big macro issue. Now, look, there were sh- certainly real state races where it had a big impact. Yeah, down ballot races, it mattered some. Um, but, but the idea that you, know, you look at a ma- big election in Trump's America – where people are arguing about Kavanaugh and immigration, and you really think this disputes about charter schooling uh, or, or college at, at college affordability are going to crack, the, 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 you know, are going to matter a lot? It wasn't. That's case. true, but we have been hearing the volume's been up on free college and student debt crisis and these issues. They're real issues. People talk about them a lot. Did it just not push anybody at the polls? Yeah, I think it didn't push very many people at the polls. When you look at the, um, you know, first of all, it's midterm elections, so young voters don't turn out as as much as um, they do for presidentials. It was up slightly this year, but still, you know, from a very low number. And really, who you get in midterms is a lot of old white people. And so what you talk about is Medicare and Social Security, protect Medicare and Social Security. And, uh, you know, as much as the AARP might be putting out new reports saying that seniors have a lot of student loan debt. We know that most of that <laughs> student loan debt is is really concentrated with the younger population. So, and and those folks are are you know focused on a lot. And of And look, issues. we're talking about you know college. You know, we're talking about college affordability. Look, if you were going to vote, you want to vote against Trump because of immigration and Kavanaugh. The idea that a Republican candidate has a college affordability plan, and you're like, oh, wait a minute, now, now I'm gonna, and, and vice versa. And look, the reality is, historically, education matters most in national contests and state contests when it uh, is a way for candidates to um, carry their message to the middle. So if you're a Democrat and you're trying to say, I'm not a tax and spender, I'm about investment and personal responsibility, education matters. If you're a Republican and you're saying, I have a heart, I'm not just about tax for the rich, education matters. This was such a polarized election. Almost all the energy was running onto the base and motivating the base. Just not a lot of room for education to matter. Yeah, just speaking, speaking of polarized, Lene, I think it was you in, in, in the conversation earlier said something about um, uh, – you know, DeVos, Secretary DeVos, uh, being in ads. And say some, say that again, what you mentioned earlier. Yeah, I, you know, most people don't think about um, cabinet secretaries very often. And I think, you know, the name recognition on, on the cabinet, whether it's Trump's or anyone else's, is usually extremely low. Uh, but in, in public opinion research, you can see DeVos has the highest name recognition of any cabinet secretary, you know, and, and she's very divisive. There are a lot of folks who, um, if they we, we were 
were talking to a couple of reporters earlier. They said anytime they can put DeVos in the headline, they get more clicks. Huh. So, so Rick, this is the overlap, right? <laughs> this is where this is where it matters. Where you can you can like you, yeah. can, you can bring divisive education issues into the into the Trump world with right. Secretary well, DeVos. it's funny That's actually. The, the only example I can think of, and it's much more limited of what Lenny's talking about, was actually uh, in 2014 after the Common Core blew up. You did see some ads with Arne Duncan that's right. become a personification uh, right, of the yeah, Obama yeah. effort to push the Common Core. But like Lynn is saying, that's incredibly unusual. Yeah. yeah, there's a notable absence of Wilbur Ross in campaign ads. <laughs> <laughs> about it. All right, so – um, You know listeners right now are like trying to check their phones. Who, the heck who is Ross? Wilbur Ross? <laughs> All right, so uh, Capitol Hill – changes, the House flips. What does this do for education? I think the uh, thing that depressed me the most about our conversation earlier was that um, I realized that those kind of Trump culture war issues are going to be the main focus of the Ed and Workforce Committee in the House because right. there is so much that they want to talk about in terms of what DeVos has done, whether it's on the Title IX regulations, whether it's on transgender students, whether it's on sexual assault or um, race and discipline. They're just go down the list, gone is obviously going to be a big focus. And so you could spend the entire next two years just doing hearings that are oversight about culture issues in Ed and Workforce. I really hope they don't do that, but I suspect there will be a lot of it. <laughs> I think that sounds that sounds right. Well, no, and, and the oversight stuff, though, that I think that the Democratic majority on the on the House uh, Education Committee will do. I mean, I think they'll, they'll, they'll do a lot of it. We haven't seen it, you know, yet. Um, Obviously, we didn't see it with the Republicans. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of things they want, they'll want to do around, like, student loan servicing, mm-hmm. um, the student loan program. There's a lot of sort of uh, anxiety and frustration built up uh, around that. And, and I think they, they're looking to blame, put that put the blame on the, on the department. For the, the... So I think one question for me is kind of how strategic they'll be. Because right, to the extent that you're not, they're, gonna, they're not going to get anything done out of the House. <laughs> I mean, so the question is, how strategic are they going to be about using House oversight to try to position the party for 2020? Mm-hmm. And so you can imagine kind of Pelosi sitting with the College of Cardinals and working out a careful rotation of hearings with themes, yeah. and almost like a presidential campaign, mm-hmm. um, in which case uh, Bobby Scott might want to run oversight on some stuff. And they're like, no, 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 we want you to stay in your lane. Mm-hmm. Or you can imagine that they're not that organized, that they don't have that much of a game plan. I'll be really curious to see how it shakes out. Well, and I'll tell you, I've been in some of those strategy conversations already, and there is a game plan and there are themes. And one thing Democrats are usually very bad at is staying on message. But this election, they really did stay on message. Those House candidates, you look at the ads and it was health care, health care, health care, taxes, corruption, health care, health care, health care, repeat, repeat, repeat. <laughs> yeah. And so somehow Democrats have learned to stay on message in, in this last election cycle. And I think they want to carry those through. So there's going to be a lot of talk about campaign finance and corruption and ethics and the swamp and Trump hasn't drained it. And so to the extent that they can go after the DeVos department as, you know, in the pocket of the for-profit industry and really focus on that right. piece, you know, their personal gain that folks within the department are getting, colluding with the for-profit industry, I think that's going to fall right in Nancy Pelosi's lane for Bobby Scott. So a lot of this is politics, but as far on the policy side, you know, they say best thing for uh, you know, fiscal discipline is divided government. Is there any reason to think that the divided house will will maybe restrain uh, the Trump administration or Betsy DeVos in, in in real ways, or is it just politics? Well, well, so I think you know, you know, having worked on Capitol Hill, you know, I mean, we're talking about divided government means stuff doesn't happen, but uh, you do have to you do have to pass a funding bill every year, so that has to happen. Uh, if it doesn't, the government shuts down. Um, so. And, and I actually I actually would go the other way. I, I've seen many times where you get divided government and you have to pass a budget bill. And so everybody just gets what they want mm-hmm. and you get you get more spending. Right. right. Where it's easy. It's almost becomes easier to get some of the things, these things done because they know they have to come to an agreement yeah. uh, and they know they have to pass this this funding bill. So you could actually that could be where some of the really interesting things are, especially for education. I mean, you could see. You know, Republicans go along with big increases in education funding uh, in, in this situation. And yeah. we we had a little discussion about HEA earlier, and I think um, Jason and I maybe had a slightly different perspective about where that would actually end up. But, you know, Lamar Alexander loves that bill, wants to do it, is termed out as chairman after this Congress. And um, he and Patty Murray have been able to work out some really big things in the past. And so, um, you know, whether Bobby Scott's going to want to play in that is, I think, an open question. But maybe he does, because uh, I, I definitely think Democrats like to get things done. It's a thing 
We like to legislate. We like to show that government's doing something. Um, and Democrats are going to want some accomplishments um, and to look like they're working with Trump in these red and purple districts where, you know, they just told people that that's what they were going to do. And I th- you know, and I mean, it's fair to it's fair to note that Senator Alexander has, you know, has taken pride, especially since he walked away from Republican leadership. He's taken real pride in trying to pass some major legislation. Yep. He did it on K-12 with ESSA. Uh, he did it uh, in health. And, you know, I think he would very much like to do a higher ed bill. So I think he'll certainly give it a fair shot. The question is, you know, in Trump's Washington, uh, given everything that's going on, whether even a skilled legislator like Alexander you know, can can deal with all the obstacles that are going to be in the way. But something that that, an obstacle that hasn't changed, though, right, that's prevented uh, Alexander from doing anything is he wants to have to do something bipartisan in the Senate uh, because of the filibuster and they don't have a filibuster proof majority. Uh, And so one of the obstacles has been doing something bipartisan with Senator Murray. And none of that has changed. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's still there. And and then I look over at at what the Democrats have proposed on on their higher ed bill, which which is out there. They put it out in, in August. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's a gigantic budget buster. I mean, it, I mean, we don't have an official number yet, but it's, I mean, it's absolutely huge. Uh, and, and I just can't see Republicans uh, getting behind anything. Well, you've got like a that. bunch of folks in that Democratic Senate caucus who are gearing up for a run in 2020. And so they're going to dig their heels in. Uh, and, you know, so the politics and, and also, I mean, it was interesting if you were reading kind of you know, the, 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 the responsible conservative analyst last night, uh, once you saw what was happening in the Senate, everybody immediately turned to what it seems like American politics is increasingly about is confirming federal judges. And so I think, you know, McConnell's focus and entire focus for the next two years is going to be getting folks on the federal bench. Yeah. And I think whether or not they actually get any legislation done is going to be, a, you know, a nice to have. All right. Well, let's move down battle a little bit and talk about governors. Uh, There's a lot of action on the governor's races. What what signals do you see coming on education from them? Let's start out with uh, Bruce Rauner and Scott Walker. Yeah, I think it was a real mixed night for the teachers unions. I think um, that actually might be success for the teachers unions right now because this was the first election after Janus. And, you know, there were concerns that their power would be wiped off the face of the earth after that Supreme Court decision. It clearly hasn't been. They were able to take down enemy number one and enemy number two in uh, Scott Walker and Bruce Rauner. I'm not sure what order they're in, but they're certainly competing for that. I think Scott Walker has the number one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, pensions are tricky. So there's there's but on the you know, on the Democratic side, we saw Ed reformer Jared Polis win in Colorado. We saw um, uh, pension reformer Gina Raimondo get reelected in Rhode Island. And then you see um, this race with Marshall Tuck in California that's still going down to the wire. So I think it was a real mixed night for them. It certainly wasn't, you know, a a teacher renaissance, as we may have uh, thought it might be. They lost in places like Oklahoma, where they really thought they had a shot because of all of the. um, Um, the teacher spring and the education issues they've had there. They only have four days of school a week in Oklahoma, and Democrats couldn't turn that into a win. Arizona, too. (laughs) And, and, you know, and rock star uh, gubernatorial candidates who were running on big new spending uh, in reddish states had a lousy night. Stacey Abrams looks like she lost in uh, in Georgia. Uh, Gillum, who was, you know, going to confiscate rifles for school safety reasons and spent a ton of money in Florida, blew it. What had been a seven-point lead on election eve, you know, DeWine held on in Ohio. You know, there, there were there was uh, uh, there was thinking that no one was going to lose in South Dakota. So, in a number of these states, uh, Ducey in Arizona, Republicans actually wound up coming out, you know, better than expected. And to Lene's point, you still saw some real kind of teacher union, progressive Democratic wins, but it was a real mixed bag. And in states like Massachusetts and Maryland. Uh, your Republican governors got reelected. I mean, it's it's a very mixed night. And the, the one we haven't talked about is Kansas, which I think came out of nowhere. Literally, my entire conference room full of people gasped when they called that one last <laughs> night. We're like, wait, that wasn't even on our list. Where did that come from? Um, but you know, I think there there were a lot of um, a lot of education dynamics in that race. Um, a lot of people that were worried about that issue. But really, ultimately, I think that came down to the immigration issue and the fact that you know the Republican candidate was so extreme and so associated with Trump and the 
and, you know, kind of the deportation squads that that probably overtook any education discussion they were having in Kansas. (laughs) Yeah, well, this is where you want to ask about the, you know, the red state strikes that happened this spring. And they were powerful. They were big news story for a long time. Lene, you said it was a long time ago. Uh, It wasn't that long ago. But yeah, you know, in politics, it can be a lifetime. Did you see it? I mean, we did talk. We just talked about Oklahoma and Arizona, where governors who are sort of pushing back on those settlements uh, for those strikes both got reelected. Well, I think the the other surprise for me last night was there was a race in Oklahoma, a House race, the Democrats won that wasn't even on the red to blue list. So that came out of nowhere, and I don't know if that had anything to do with some of the energy right. um, from the teacher strike. But um, you know, the red to blue list was almost the entire map this year. So the fact that there was one that wasn't even on it <laughs> that. One and came out of nowhere was you know was a total anomaly and and so maybe there was some connection there. Yeah, but you know, but but at the same time, it's, I mean, so it really is a mixed bag, uh, right? The teacher unions had made a real point; they wanted to take the governor's mansions in Arizona and Oklahoma, which were in some sense the epicenter uh, of the strikes. Uh, they they struck out on both uh, on both cases, running an ed school professor in Arizona. Yeah. In Oklahoma, there was a referenda uh, to allow property tax to be spent for school funding. That went down to defeat. At the same time, in Arizona, uh, a conservative referenda for to uh, universalize education savings accounts legislation went down by a massive margin, two to one. So, I mean, I think one argument here is that what you saw was the enthusiasms, um, some of the more exuberant enthusiasms of the people who wanted to really do big, dramatic infusions of cash in purple and red states. They got pushed back on. And you saw, you know, education savings accounts and Scott Walker People who were really making big, ambitious, exuberant, uh, seen as big, ambitious, exuberant champions of choice got pushed back on also right. in, in purplish states. And, you know, we've talked about everybody loves education funding. You poll it and 105 percent of people will say, yes, give more money to schools. Usually they say take it from like waste and abuse in the government and, you know, the <laughs> foreign right. aid budget or yeah. something. Yeah. But um, but when they when you say take it, from, should we take it from more taxes? They say no, usually. And they said no in Colorado, even as uh, an education government governor was was winning that race. And um, so I do think there's, um, you know, there's kind of an abstract that voters are like, yeah, I'm for that. But then when it actually comes down to it, they just don't want to raise right. taxes. To so do in that. Arizona, just to put a fine point on the line, Ducey ran promising a big teacher raise and a big tax cut. And it turns out Arizona's foreign aid budget is really small. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yeah, it's interesting in Arizona, uh, their state chief race was super close. In a pretty red state, Kathy Hoffman might have been, you know, if she ekes it out, will be the first Democratic statewide uh, office holder in a decade. So, it, you know, that could be one of those points where the union would say, hey, we got a lot of traction here. Well, and it I, didn't show up in the governor's race. I think when you uh, look at the ed reformers, too, there's there's a real mixed bag. And one of the things that I um, was watching kind of with bated breath was the New Mexico governor's race. And in the New Mexico governor's race, both candidates said, I want to roll back testing. I want to roll back what we've right. done, um, you know, in, in terms of accountability and so I do think there's a little bit of a um, kind of a mix right now. Um, things have been shaken up a bit in terms of the accountability, civil rights testing conversation. And it seems like electeds on both sides at the state level are kind of tiptoeing away from it as much as they can, some walking swiftly away from it. And that's happening on both sides. Yeah. What do you think about that, Rick? I mean, New Mexico is a really interesting case where it was like one of the last holdouts from sort of no child left behind style accountability. And now they're... You know, the new governor wants to get rid of park. Are there any park uh, (laughs) states left? I don't know. Uh, You know, but what does this signal about that sort of accountability regime? Is that is this just the last of the wave and we're pulling back to the center? It has been a tough six years for park, man. It's like, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, you know, I mean, it's funny because, uh, you know, under Governor Martinez, who was a real disciple of Jeb Bush style school reform, Hannah Scandera went out there and, you know, broke her pick for years fighting for accountability and teacher evaluation. Christopher Ruskowski has gone out there and broke his pick uh, trying to build on uh, Skander's legacy. And as Lene mentioned, both gubernatorial candidates said, we're going to walk away from this and change direction. And when you look at it, um, I mean, you have to look long and hard across the country now to really identify states that you would say, yeah, um, they're doing uh, test-based accountability uh, the way we, the, the way that 
the center left and center right were kind of embracing it in the Bush Obama years. In, in some sense, uh, New Mexico was one of kind of the last holdouts. And the fact that nobody was in that gubernatorial campaign fighting to hold hold the line just says a lot, I think, about how uh, both the electorate and, and, and electeds have really um, grown disenchanted with kind of the building blocks of Bush Obama reform. Well, and maybe that is um, part of the impact of the teacher spring, right? That Mm -hmm. now we're talking about raises for teachers and not uh, increased student outcomes in Mm K-12. So if if everybody's rolling back the K-12 accountability uh, agenda from the past 15 years or so, I mean, this election does mean something, though, for higher ed accountability because the Democrats are all about it, right? And then they're, that this is their issue, and it's it's all over the, the proposal that that, that um, the new chairman of the Education Committee uh, has. What, it, what do you think of this, Lene? Well, I think it's a great thing because I think generally Democrats have been really good at saying, let's just throw a bunch more money into something. I mean, that's our solution generally to most problems, but certainly in higher ed, let's give a lot more money. And in fact, we can't ask for more accountability or better student outcomes because, um, you know, the institutions that might be impacted by that are ones we like. So we can't do it. Um, and so and this we're is... We're going to see this. Though. This, this is, yeah, be the, like, this has this actually is... been a big shift to, in the higher education politics. And I think um, in particular on the Democratic Democratic side, but um, but really on both sides of the aisle, this idea of thinking that we might want to get something for the $130 billion we spend a year on higher education or whatever it is, um, that, you know, we're, we're going to see um, the conversations bubbling up that we saw 15 years ago on, on K-12. And um, I think we're all very aware that we don't want to follow this similar trajectory of where the K-12 situation went. But, you know, if you look at where we're starting right now, we ask for nothing and we give huge amounts of money and proportionally so much more than we do in the K-12 space. In the K-12 space, we're doing like 10 percent of the money and all the accountability. And here we're asking for, for, yeah, on the federal level. That's right. So um, how do, you know, how do we get like a little bit of accountability on the higher ed side without having the same kind of backlash that we created on K-12? I think that's the question. So I I think that's that's, that's the policy question. Mm -hmm. And I think the political question that goes with that is today, the free college proposals that these that folks are talking about in the states haven't really had much, if anything, in the way of accountability. It's mostly been stitching together some mon- some funding sources. Yep. So the question is going to be: If you're a Democrat and you're trying to simultaneously placate a, an energized teacher union wing, and you don't want to tick off, you, you know, uh, your strong uh, relationships uh, with the higher ed community, um, and you're running as you know, you're running in a democratic in a democratic field where you're trying to run as far to the left as possible. Well, you may or may not be trying to run as far as there will be a left lane that you'll be trying to take out Bernie Sanders. There will be a question about how much enthusiasm there's going to be among democratic field, kind of heading into 2020, mm-hmm. to actually be talking about accountability and um, return on investment and testing mechanisms that are going to be used to deny um, colleges access to money for students. And that's going to be that, – that'll be a very difficult thing for them to politically message, I think. Well, I, I don't know because I think part of the um, – kind of this, the snowball um, all started with the with the for-profits, right? And the Democrats there's, – there's no political downside in hitting for-profits on the <laughs> right, Democratic so. <laughs> side. So we're going to keep doing that. People are going to keep doing that. And certainly with the oversight of DeVos, that's going to be a But is there a, a downside theme. when you extend it to public? Uh, well, I think there, there are some political downsides to that. But, um, but it's kind of – it's I mean, kind of – caught up with people, right? It's and like finding, finding your local community college. Right? Right. It can't, it's not going to play well. Well, it, it doesn't necessarily play well um, on the details. It just like closing schools on the K-12 level yeah. doesn't play well on the details right. when you're actually talking about what is that, um, you know, what is that mechanism that you use to keep someone out of Title IV? Uh, but you, when you start to use this language of getting return on investment, of colleges scamming kids, of um, worthless degrees, it it kind of catches to the the rest of the industry, and I think that there are there are enough people that have worked that language about you know students being swindled into their into their repertoire that all of a sudden they're like, wait a minute, 
now I accidentally said something about the rest of the higher education industry that I didn't mean to, but here I am. So I do think there will be a lane for that. That would be, be so true because, you know, I just think about, you know, Cory Booker, for instance, mm-hmm. backpedaling as fast as possible on the K-12 stuff. Yeah. So it's hard to see, <laughs> you, you know, a Gillibrand or a Booker or one of these guys starting to talk about – I. I Got no problem seeing them talking about students swindled by for profits. Yeah. You start to. Uh, uh, it's going to be interesting to see them try to use the talking points they've been talking and then start talking about ROI and college completion. Well, it really depends on uh, you know where you're coming from. I think the senators are in a very specific spot. I personally don't think that you know someone from Washington D.C. is who the Democrats are going to nominate in 2020 because why would we? Um, why would we take from the swamp? So there are on my list of of people who are running, two thirds of them are not from D.C. They're not senators or representatives, and they have a very different perspective. And governors been doing a lot of work on, um, you know, how do we actually um, use the higher education system to equip students to get a job and do it well. And that's a, um, you know, that's a return on investment conversation that people have been having at the state and at the city level in the way they haven't up here. So we started this conversation out. Let's end it on the same sort of question. Uh, You know, Ed Week and the Chronicle, they got to fill papers for the next couple of years. So what are they going to be writing about that this election sort of brings brings up? And is any of it going to make the Times of the Post? Oh, and oversight hearings are great. They make for great copy. So I think there'll, there'll be a lot of that. Yeah, subpoenas, subpoenas, subpoenas. Right. Um, and, you know, some of those things will make the, the Post and the Times because, as I said, people know who DeVos is and those titles get clicks. And I think, um, you know, my test is always do people who don't work on education at my organization send me those articles? And as long as DeVos's name is in the title, they do. Yeah, they won't have to, they won't have to do their freedom of information requests anymore. The, the committee staff will just do it for them. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, you know, and I, I think I, – I think – you know, and Andrew, that's exactly right. That stuff's going to get written. But I think it'll also be misleading because, look, so long as Trump is president and so long as people are, are you know, as long as there's a resistance and there's this gut level primal reaction to what's going on, it's just going to be really hard for education to get traction as an issue that's going to be determinant in more than a handful uh, of contests in states. Well, and that, I think, is a good thing because actually if we're going to get something done, it needs to be outside of the limelight of the um, polarization. And that's why I think um, education is a space where we actually might see some movement in in at least some small way because Trump doesn't actually care about this and, frankly, neither does the resistance. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, back to the uh, 4% of people who think education is the top issue to move forward on in the next election, right? They're probably listening to this podcast. That's right. They probably are. (laughs) Thanks for listening to this special election episode of The Report Card with Nat Malkus. And special thanks to our guests, Jason, Rick, and Lene Erickson. You can subscribe to The Report Card on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast player. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes or Google. If you have comments, questions, or topic suggestions for future episodes, reach out to us at ed.podcast at AEI.com. Until next time, I'm Nat Malkus.